In this video, I'm going to help you become more efficient in your studies by visually ranking the best and the worst study techniques according to scientific research. Now, this is based off 414 research papers and citations dating back from 1906 to 2013, over 100 years of wisdom condensed to this video. So for each study method, I'm going to rank them based on two things. Now, number one is the evidence score. What past 100 years of research tell us about the study method and I'll give a score out of 10. And number two is the practical score. From my personal experience studying 10 years myself, to qualify both as a pharmacist and a doctor and coaching study performance from one-on-one -on -one tutoring to building online programs helping over a thousand student pharmacists, a thousand five hundred student doctors and a hundred thousand high school and university students worldwide. I'll rate each study method from a practical implementation point of view out of 10. And then finally I'll be combining the evidence score and the practical score and then I'll rate an overall score and put this on the ranking chart. So let's dive right into this. So for those of you who have clicked into this video, you probably know about active recall and space repetition and how effective it can be for studying. And you might ask, why isn't this on the list specifically? Now active recall and space repetition is only a broad study technique and there are so many specific methods and apps that you can actually use and apply these principles. And not all active recall and space repetition specific methods are created equally. Now this is why we're going to dive much deeper into each specific active recall and space repetition method, giving them an evidence-based score and a practical score. So you know, within the broad category of active recall and space repetition, which one you're going to be using more. So first, I'm going to recap the four most popular but ineffective study techniques of them all. And if you also watch Ali's video on the evidence-based study techniques, here is a quick recap. So number one is highlighting. We already know so many studies have concluded highlighting or underlining is a very popular but ineffective study technique. And here is a list of just some of the scientific papers that says this. So Professor John Dunlosky is a psychology professor out of Kent State University who is absolute authority in learning and metacognition. He has published hundreds of research papers in effective learning techniques and in this paper he summarizes that the students are already familiar with and spontaneously adopt the technique of highlighting. The problem is that the way the technique is typically implemented is not effective. So basically highlighting is easy to pick up because this is what everyone does but when everyone does the same thing it doesn't mean it's necessarily effective or the best way for you to study. And Professor Danlowski continues to say on the basis of the available evidence we rate highlighting and underlining as having low use utility. In most situations that have been examined and with most participants, highlighting does little to boost performance. It may help when students have the knowledge needed to highlight more effectively or when texts are difficult, but it may actually hurt performance on higher level tasks that require inference making. I'm basically saying that highlighting isn't very effective and when you need to show actual understanding of the information and concepts you highlighted, you often can't give the right explanation or rationale behind the text you highlighted, meaning most of this time you put into highlighting has been a waste of time. So the evidence-based score for highlighting is 1 out of 10. So from a practical point of view, highlighting isn't very effective. One upside would be that highlighting can be an aid that actually helps you focus and act as a visual guide so you don't have to reread the same line again and again. But overall, it isn't very effective. So the practical score for highlighting is 1 out of 10. And the overall score for highlighting is 1 out of 10, which is a D. And on to number 2, which is rereading. So rereading textbooks or rewatching lectures fall into the same category. And I fell into the same trap back in high school and my undergraduate pharmacy degree as well. Now this is indeed a huge time sucker that actually doesn't put much information into your brain. And the evidence says the same. Carrier study in 2003, a survey in college psychology students actually reported 65% of these students reported that they did use rereading as a technique when they prepare for exams. And Professor Danlowski also concluded, although rereading is relatively economical with respect to time demands and training requirements when compared to some other learning techniques, rereading is also typically much less effective. The relative disadvantage of rereading to other techniques is a large strike against rereading and is the factor that weighed most heavily in our decision to assign it a rating of low utility. Basically saying that rereading isn't time consuming but it isn't effective either. So an evidence-based score for rereading is 1 out of 10 and from a practical standpoint most of the time spent rereading makes us feel productive that we're actually studying but a simple test would be after rereading three paragraphs in your textbook close this and ask yourself how much have you actually remembered how much can you actually write down and how much of that time you spent rereading were you actually zoned out and not actually focusing. And having done this exercise with so many students, most are actually surprised that they haven't retained much at all. And in other words, all this time you spent looking busy is actually wasted. You might as well have gone for a nap to recharge or have gone to watch a movie instead. And the result is actually almost similar. So feeling productive and actually being productive are actually two very different things. And this is why when 
moment, I was in high school studying 8 hours a day and still failing subjects, but when I was in med school with 10 times as much content, I can study just 2 hours a day and still achieve top 10% and build multiple businesses. So the practical score for rereading is 1 out of 10, and the overall score for rereading is 1 out of 10, which places it at a D, which is staying away from it at all costs. So on to number 3, which is making notes. Making notes is definitely a common study technique. You feel like it is a must that you have these beautiful handwritten notes, organized typed up notes and all. You even try to look for the best way to make notes, but does this actually translate to better grades? So Britzing in 1979 had a high school student study a 2000 word text that was about a made up tribe of people. And they were split into one of three groups using different study techniques. So number one was the control group, just reading the text and doing nothing else. And number two is the note taking group, actually taking a few lines of notes while reading. And number three was the summarizing group, using their own words to explain what they have just read. And after that, they were then asked 25 questions that requires them to distill information across this 2000 word text. So our control group of just reading text got 11 out of 25, which was 44% on this immediate test. Another group that was tested one week later, and not surprisingly, our control reading text group results were actually lower and got only 8 out of 25, which was 32%. So with the note taken group that actually took the test immediately, they got 14 out of 25, which was 55% average. And a delayed testing group a week later got 10 out of 25, which was 40%. And the students who actually took time to summarize the information that they got was 14 out of 25, which is 56% in the immediate test group, and also 11 out of 25, which is 44% in the delay group tested one week later. So as you can see, with the note taking and summarization, this is already better than just passively reading because we're actually processing information in front of us. And Professor Danowski also summarized in his paper, on the basis of the available evidence, we rate summarization as low utility. It can be an effective learning strategy for learners who are already skilled at summarizing. However, many learners, including children, high school students, and even some undergraduates, will require extensive training, which makes the strategy less feasible. Our enthusiasm is further dampened by mixed findings regarding which task summarization actually helps. So basically, making good notes and good summaries take a lot of skill and there are mixed research findings, but some studies do show that it helps. So the evidence score of making notes or summarization is 4 out of 10. And from a practical point of view, students keep asking me, what is the best way to make notes? So my question back to my students would be, why do you want to make notes? Does it put information into your brain effectively and also translate to better exam grades? And I've fallen victim to this superficially productive method myself. You feel like you're making progress, handwriting beautiful notes and these comprehensive organized typed up notes. So I remember in the early years of pharmacy, I spent most of my semester making this beautiful study Bible, but actually not absorbing the information from it. And this was the first time I actually got B in my undergraduate studies. The notes were beautiful and the summary was great. People were even asking me if they could buy this book from me for $50. And again, looking back now, this was actually superficial productivity. I could have just used someone else's notes or used some of the techniques that I will cover really soon. So the practical score of actually making making notes or summarization is 2 out of 10. And the overall score of making notes and summarization brings it up to 3 out of 10, which is a C. So this brings us to number 4, which is mnemonics. And mnemonics is a use of words and making each letter in this word meaningful so you can actually remember a list of facts. So like to see if someone is having a stroke in the community. So the public is actually taught to think faster, F-A-S-T. So F for face drooping and A for arm weakness and S is for speech difficulty. And T is for taking action fast and actually call the ambulance if you see any of these symptoms. And I have quite a strong opinion on this particular method, but let's see what the evidence says. So according to Professor Danlowski's analysis, on the basis of the literature reviewed above, we rate the keyword mnemonic as low utility. We cannot recommend that the keyword mnemonic be widely adopted. It does show promise for keyword friendly materials, but it is not highly efficient in terms of the time needed for training and keyword generation, and it may not produce durable learning. So basically he says for some specific situations, it can be used, but it isn't actually that useful for learning information effectively. So the evidence score for mnemonics is 3 out of 10. But what about practically? My friend in med school actually absolutely swears by it. Like remembering the symptoms of a condition called SLE, systemic lupus erythematosus. So a condition where your immune system attacks your own self and actually affects most of your body and causes inflammation and damage everywhere. So the popular mnemonic, a rash points an MD, which is a doctor, to a possible diagnosis of SLE. That's how we remember.
remember it. So you remember a rash point MD. So each letter is a symptom that points more towards SLE. So for example, A for arthritis, R for renal disease, ANA positive, hematological disorders, photosensitivity, oral ulcers, immunological disorder, neurological disorder, malar rash, discoid rash. And you can see why I'm so against this. It is so easy to step into rote repetition again. So A for arthritis, R for renal disease. Oh, what was A again? I just forgot. So it doesn't actually provide you context or deep learning. And you end up in the exam when they ask you, what are the symptoms for SLE? And you remember, oh yes, a rash points MD. But you actually forgot what the second A stands for. And you keep saying a rash points MD to yourself and actually nothing comes up to your mind. But actually taking the time to understand how your immune system is too active, attacking your kidneys, your nerves, your joints, your skin causing rashes serves you much better. And you're more likely to remember it when you actually need to use it to save a life in the future. So a practical score for mnemonics is three out of 10. An overall score for mnemonics is three out of 10, which brings it to a C. And so on to number five study method, which is rote learning. So rote learning, in other words, chanting or copying information until you beat your brain into submission is now actually widely known to be ineffective. A researcher has taken a group of 149 physiotherapy students and compared whether they were rote learning or they call superficial approach or engaging in deep learning like using the principle of active recall. And these groups were actually tracked and their exam scores were compared. So in the rote learning group, the mean score was 41.42% and the deep learning group was 67.92%. Now this is more than 20% increase by just not doing rote learning and picking up things like deep learning. So the evidence score for rote learning is unsurprisingly low at a 1 out of 10. And practically, I think this is quite unhelpful. So my girlfriend back in pharmacy used to write all over her notepad and keep scribbling until she remembers the information briefly. And we used to study about the same amount of time, but I tend to get at least 10 to 15% higher than her consistently. Now thinking back now, this is exactly reflecting the results of this study that I just mentioned. So the practical score of rote learning is also low, rating at a 1 out of 10. An overall score of rote learning is 1 out of 10, which is a D. Again, stay away at all costs if you can. And on to number 6 study method, which is the 5-10-15 rule. Now, 5-10-15 rule is basically getting you to explain a concept in simple words so a 5-year-old, 10-year-old, and a 15-year-old can understand you. Beautifully incorporate some of the most effective learning techniques there are out there, including active recall, teaching, and most importantly, elaborative interrogation. Now, elaborative interrogation was first mentioned in Presley et al.'s paper in 1987, getting undergraduates a list of sentences describing action like the hungry man got in the car. So the first group just gets to read the sentence. And then we've got a second group that uses elaborative interrogation. So they ask the students to ask why did this hungry man get into the car? And then they were provided an explanation. Well, because they needed to go to a restaurant because they're hungry, right? And later they will ask who got in the car. So in this control group who just read the sentence, the hungry man got into the car, only 30% of the students who remembered it was the hungry man that actually got into the car. But in the elaborative interrogation group, these people who ask for the reason why did this hungry man get into the car because you needed to go to the restaurant, 72% of the students actually got it right. And there was a significant difference between this group because when we revert back to our three-year-old self, asking why and request an explanation for everything we don't understand rather than just accepting facts as gospel and using rote repetition to beat our brain into submission. So this 5, 10, 15 rule, incorporating active recall, teaching and elaborative interrogation, which is all highly evidence-based and I'll give this a 10 out of 10. And so for the practical part, this is really the technique I solely relied on to study two to three hours each day in med school and still achieve top 10% and I absolutely swear by it. And if you ask me about the minute dry facts, I won't remember much, but I absolutely love concepts and deep learning and relating these to simple real life analogies that could be taught to lay people. And if you ask a first year medical student to explain what asthma is and how these puffers work to treat asthma, it's really hard to explain this to a five year old without jargon. You almost always have to have a simple analogy that involves you understanding this topic very well so you can actually compare this to an everyday example. So when a first year medical student learns about asthma, they might explain to you, asthma is the constriction of bronchioles of the lung that causes wheezing and shortness of breath. Now this isn't wrong technically, but there are just too many jargons and this five year old won't understand you and this patient might be confused about the condition that they have. Now when you first do this, it's very hard to make it more simple, but when you actually understand it very well, we can even start to use simple analogies, just using our hands and maybe a tissue paper to demonstrate this. So here is how I would explain it now to my patients. Mr. Brown, to stay alive, Life, we actually need to breathe well. We need to breathe air through our nose down into more and more narrow pipes. It's just like how trees branch into smaller branches. And this is your small pipes. And when you have asthma, things like cold air or infection can cause this pipe to go even smaller. So air is actually hard to pass. So this is why it is hard for us to breathe. And when this happens, your lungs also make these thick, sticky fluid like this tissue paper and actually block the pipe. And so this blue inhaler works well because it makes this pipe a bit wider. But 
it doesn't get rid of this tissue paper in the middle. And so this second orange inhaler needs to be used regularly, not just one day, but many weeks and months to actually remove this flick fluid so you can actually breathe better in the long run. And this is also exactly how I made elaborative interrogation simpler to a five-year-old using the 5, 10, 15 rule so I can make elaborative interrogation simpler. So for the practical score for the 5, 10, 15 rule is 10 out of 10, very useful for my own personal experience and results from my past students as well. And so this brings our overall score for the 5, 10, 15 rule to a 10 out of 10, which is A++. And I recommend you to actually try to implement this as much as possible. Keep breaking these concepts ideas down into simple words, simple analogies, and try to teach others. And this is the gold standard of learning and essentially active recall on steroids. Now this brings us to number seven, which is practice testing. So practice testing uses the same principle of 5, 10, 15 rule of active recall. So in McDaniel's paper in 2012, now students with no practice testing scored around 65% with tests that have repeated or completely new questions. And when practice tests or past exam papers were done, students were actually scoring 75% with the exam that had all completely new questions and scored almost 90% with exams that used past recycled questions. And Professor Danlowski also concluded on the basis of the evidence described in above, we rate practice testing as having high utility. Now testing effects have been demonstrated across an impressive range of practice test formats, kinds of material, learner ages, outcome measures, and retention intervals. Practice testing is not particularly time intensive relative to other techniques and it can be implemented with minimal training. So the evidence score basically saying is really, really effective to use practice testing. And so the evidence-based score for practice testing is eight out of 10. And so from a practical standpoint, practice testing includes using flashcards, Cornell note-taking method, and past practice questions. Uh, this is particularly true when schools and universities tend not to create all new questions every single year because it takes so much time. Now doing exams in the past actually gives you an advantage because they often recycle questions and that you are more likely to know the answer already. And it also forces you to do active recall effectively when you use practice testing as your primary study method. So the practical score for practice testing is rated at eight out of 10, which brings us to an overall score for practice testing at eight out of 10, which is an A. And on to number eight, which is interleaving. So interleaving is a fancy term that says that you should be switching between subjects while studying. Most students, including me in high school, tend to study in blocks. I want to do a solid two hour block of biology before we switch over to chemistry for another two hours. So instead, interleaving encourages you to switch between subjects more often. Now this was a test that Roa and Taylor did in 2007. A two group of math students. Now one group learning about how to solve one type of shape and then doing a few practice questions about the same shape. Then learning about a second type of shape, then doing four practice sessions about this second type of shape. This was continued until they learned the third one and the fourth one and they learned all four. Now this is the blocking group. And then the second group that was using interleaving. So reading a tutorial about all four of the shapes and then they were given four questions all with different types of shapes. So they needed to actually switch their brain to actually solve for different shapes for every single question. So during the practice, the blocking group of course did much better because they only had to focus on one particular problem at a time. They scored 90% and the interleaved group only scored 60% on average. Now keep in mind that this interleaved group kept on switching between the shapes, but it's actually much harder for them to actually do this practice test. But the interesting thing is that they repeated the test about one week later. So the blocking group only achieved 20% and the interleave group still managed to achieve above 60%. And Professor Danlowski also concluded, on the basis of available evidence, we rate interleaved practice as having moderate utility. On the positive side, interleaved practice has been shown to have relatively dramatic effects on students learning and retention of mathematical skills. And teachers and students should consider adopting it in the appropriate context. And basically saying that in math, it works very well and you can also try in other areas as well. So this evidence-based score of interleaving brings us to a 7 out of 10. So from a practical standpoint, I haven't actually personally used this method much for my own studies and I do finding switching subjects too often do tend to feel like I'm losing focus and I have to re-warm up on my study efficiency curve or SEC. And this SEC concept is also covered in my 7 bad study habits of highly ineffective students which is linked here on the screen. Now some of the students do find this helpful as they feel that they gain more focus and they get to actually start fresh again when they switch subjects. And this is really up to personal preference and experimentation. So which brings our practical score of interleaving to 5 out of 10. And our overall score of interleaving is 6 out of 10, which is a B. Now this brings us to number 9, which is Anki. So Anki is an app that tries to incorporate active recall and space repetition. So you can actually create your own set of flashcards or import other people's flashcards into this app. So for evidence-based score, we know for active recall and space repetition, which Anki uses, is very high. So we rate the evidence-based score for Anki at 8 out of 10. But from a practical point of view, it's correct that active recall and space repetition is attempted to be used here. But when you actually get into using this app, you will actually find a few difficulties. And number one, it's actually not very useful for concepts. So a lot of subjects like biology, physiology, and physics, they're actually highly concept-based. And Anki does actually a poor job 
about this. Now, if you attempt to put these long concepts into these flashcards, you essentially revert back to rote learning, which is a very ineffective use of your time based on an evidence-based score and practical score. And then number two is cards overload. If you actually don't stay consistent, your cards will actually pile up and cause you more stress and anxiety over time. So number three, the default settings are quite unhelpful for your learning. Sometimes you see the cards too often and the repeat time frame is too short and you actually get tired of the app and you actually close it and become demotivated. There are actually settings to actually try to overcome this and you can take this five hour Skillshare course on just to learn how to use the app properly, but it doesn't solve number four. So number four is no overview of your knowledge. So if you visually want to see how well you're progressing with your knowledge, like you're doing four subjects and having thousands of cards, it's actually hard to know which topics are your weaknesses because often they're all lumped together. So the practical score for Anki is four out of 10. So there are some downsides as we've just talked about right now, but still great for facts if you actually get the Anki settings right and use it consistently. So the overall score for Anki brings us to a six out of 10, which is a B. And we've talked about the downsides of Anki and I wish to introduce you to the next study method, which is designed to overcome these Anki downsides when done properly, which brings us to number 10, which is our knowledge-based timetable. Essentially, this is the 80-20 rule of studying the 20% of input you should be focused on to get these 80% of your results. Now this incorporates elegantly the most effective evidence-based principle of learning, including active recall, space repetition, subject scoping, and actually having the ability to track your knowledge gaps on demand. So when done well, it gives you the ultimate productivity edge over other students and help you remain calm and poised when others are scrambling in chaos as exam time comes. So essentially, you have your subject scoping for a given course. Now this incorporates all the learning objectives that will be taught. And throughout the semester, as your lecturer teaches you information, or if you self-learn your course material, you continue to incorporate active recall each day. Now trying to finish covering the whole syllabus over time. Now each time you intentionally close all your lecture slides, books and reference materials and test yourself to see if you can answer these learning objectives adequately. Now your knowledge is then objectively rated bad in red, moderate in orange and good in green. And you continue to work through these at a preset pace. For example, if you have 100 days to cover 400 objectives, it will be four objectives per day. Once you've completed these four objectives for that day, you're now guilt free to do whatever you like and have a study life balance because you know that you're on track. Now, as exam time comes two to four weeks away, you should sit down and refresh your knowledge based timetable by testing yourself from top to bottom just once and identify all your knowledge gaps because this may have changed. Your previous green knowledge now may have been orange or even red. You then can now have a refreshed set of knowledge. And now you have tracked your knowledge from top to bottom, you can then systematically work through your red knowledge and orange knowledge and green knowledge and turn them all green and maximize your chances of success in the exam. Now this gives you calmness and serenity because you know exactly how well you're tracking and what exactly you need to work on in your study session next time. And there's no more panicking in the middle of the night just before you're about to go to sleep, whether you've forgotten lecture one because you have all this at a glance in front of you. Now this study method is so important that I've actually dedicated a 20 minute video detailing how you could implement this in your own studies, including examples from Microsoft Word, Excel, OneNote, and Notion. So the evidence of active recall, space repetition, and subject scoping have been covered, and the evidence-based score for this knowledge-based timetable is 10 out of 10. And from a practical standpoint, I always encourage my students to never take my way of doing things as gospel. I normally encourage my students to experiment things themselves, including their study methods, their memorization methods, to their sleep cycle and diet to actually maximize personal performance during the exam preparation. Now the knowledge based timetable is probably this one thing I try to push all my students to establish because it is so effective and it brings so much order, sanity and sustainability to your studies. And if done well, your study life balance can be planned out very well. Just like so many of my students have had such a good study life balance since adopting this method. So the practical score for this knowledge based timetable is 10 out of 10. So overall, the knowledge based timetable is 10 out of 10, which is A++. And I will strongly, strongly recommend you to try this out and hope it gives you a massive boost to your study life balance as well. We know that just knowing these techniques alone doesn't directly translate to good grades. So if you would like me personally to keep you accountable for your studies and implement this to your own study routine, please check out our complete study system using the link below on our website. The program also includes a 28 day accountability program and an amazing community of high achieving students worldwide, including Harvard and Yale students. And I hope you've enjoyed this video and please subscribe for more and I look forward to seeing you in the next one.